Excellent. Well, thank you very much for this very, very kind invitation to speak at what is an absolutely fantastic meeting. You know, I, I, this seems in clinical cardiology to be almost like a paradigm shift happening at the moment, away from the end organ. Um, as you know, we've heard all about these various studies and all the basic science research that's going on at the moment. And I have to say, as a cardiologist, I've not shifted that far away from the end organ. If you take Drew's uh, fantastic model here, I've perhaps moved a little bit away from the heart, perhaps to efferent, sympathetic and parasympathetic um, neurons, but I have to admit, probably no further than that, actually. And I also have to say that for me, a lot of this is a little bit of a black box experimentally in terms of the techniques that I'm using to try and um, to try and figure out what's going on. So I'm going to start off by making that apology. Um, I suppose I've been very interested in these in these efferent neurons and the relationship between them, the cardiac myocyte and the microvasculature, and the relationship between these and the various neuromodulators that are released by the different tissues. And I, I did my DPhil with David Patterson in the late 1990s and we've worked on various molecules um, that, that can affect how these nerves and how these cells work. More recently I've been very interested in neuropeptide Y as a sympathetic co-transmitter that tends to be released when sympathetic neurons are stimulated for long periods of time and often at very high frequencies. And collaborating with, with Beth Habaker and with Rodney Parsons we've looked at how neuropeptide Y released from sympathetic neurons can cross-talk and reduce the ability of the vagus nerve to reduce heart rate, um, sort of sympathovagal cross-talk. I'm actually not going to present this data that's been in the public domain for quite a while now. Instead, I'd, I'd like to focus a little bit more on the role that neuropeptide Y might be playing as a potent vasoconstrictor of the coronary microvasculature. We've published some of this work in Heart in 2013. And I'd also like to show you some unpublished data of the potential action of neuropeptide Y directly onto the cardiac myocyte. So we have beta blockers and, you know, the, the, as clinicians we feel happy that these beta blockers are antiarrhythmic and they're, you know, they're doing a, a really good prognostic thing. But of course, if during heart failure, myocardial infarction, when there's high levels of sympathetic drive and neuropeptide Y being released, there's potentially a whole other receptor-mediated pathway here on the cardiac myocyte. And I'll show you a little bit of that data um, later. First of all, though, I'd like to just concentrate on the effect of neuropeptide Y on the microvasculature. And the context which I want to talk about that is in ST elevation myocardial infarctions. And as I'm sure certainly the clinicians in the room know, this is pictures taken from Oxford. Certainly if you call an ambulance and you've got bad chest pain and ST elevation on your ECG, in Oxford this ECG is transferred to the heart center, the coronary care unit, such that the ambulance will not take you to the accident and emergency department. They'll take you straight to the front door of the heart center. And ca cardiologists, I, I'm not a plumber, I'm more an electrician when it comes to doing, uh, doing cardiology, I have to say. But um, one of my interventional colleagues, shall we say, will perform an emergency PCI procedure to try and open up that blocked coronary artery and reperfuse the heart. And to be fair to to be fair to my colleagues, their sort of door to balloon time is between 10 and 15 minutes, which in the UK is is about average. Um, the problem is, is in about a third of these cases, we stent the artery and those clinicians who read the reports, it always says, excellent result. And actually, in reality, it's not always an excellent result. About a third of these patients, you get poor flow in the coronary microvasculature. They have, these patients have larger infarcts, and they do very poorly, generally. And the question is, is well, What's causing that? And it's probably multifactorial. There's no doubt an embolic component of this. There's probably a sort of vasoconstrictive physiological component to it. And that led me to, to sort of want to measure neuropeptide Y levels in these patients because certainly in animal studies, neuropeptide Y is a very potent, one of the most potent, in fact, vasoconstrictors.
So what we did is we measured neuropeptide Y initially from plasma, yeah, peripheral um, venous plasma samples, because we could measure pre, post PCI and during the first 20, uh, sorry, the first 48 hours. And I think the first thing I'd like to say is the normal range here is about three picograms per milliliter. So, you know, these patients, unsurprisingly, considering they're obviously in a lot of, having a lot of pain, they're cold, they're clammy, they've got a very high sympathetic drive, they have very high levels of plasma neuropeptide Y that sort of come down, but in reality still remain elevated over this first 48 hour period. And the interesting thing is you can almost dichotomize the groups of patients into those who get ST elevation, or they get resolution of their ST elevation, those who have angiographic reflow, and also the MPY levels. And it correlates quite nicely if you do physiological measures of the coronary microvasculature, for example, coronary flow reserve or index of microvascular resistance, these lines also separate. And it just begs the question as to, is neuropeptide Y actually causing a functional vasoconstriction in these patients? So taking this one time point, what we're in the process of doing now, immediately post-PCI at least, is taking coronary sinus samples, taking blood samples from the aortic root, and trying to measure what the actual cardiac release of neuropeptide Y is, at least at this one time point. What we're also doing is taking left atrial appendage samples and dissecting out the coronary um, um, arterioles, you know, at the sort of 100 micrometer level. And this is in collaboration with Kim Dora um, at the University of Oxford. So we can pressurize these vessels. We can measure their contraction. Kim uh, has got a whole a very nice system set up for calcium imaging them and this sort of thing so we can investigate the sort of functional aspect of what neuropeptide Y is doing in these small arterioles from human hearts as well. And just some preliminary data, here's just some very early immunohistochemistry showing uh, one of these arterioles, the vessel media, most of the nuclei in purple here with DAPI in the vascular smooth muscle layer, and certainly in green we see that there's definitely neuropeptide Y1 receptors on the vascular smooth muscle that could be causing the vasoconstriction. So what I want to focus on now is the second part of our current work, which is a potential role for neuropeptide Y being released from sympathetic neurons acting directly on the myocytes themselves. And this comes from an observation by Gomez in 2005 on isolated ventricular myocytes doing calcium imaging in which they found application of MPY causes an increase in the actual intracellular calcium transient. In fact, it even causes spontaneous calcium sparks to happen. And it just made me thought when I read this, well, you know, if we've got beta blockers on and here's neuropeptide Y causing calcium overload in the myocytes, well, we're missing a trick here. This is something that could be quite proarrhythmic. So this led me to the hypothesis of, you know, is neuropeptide Y a novel independent proarrhythmic trigger? Um, is there a receptor-based mechanism by which it's doing this on the myocyte, which Gomez hadn't really got to the bottom of? And it also begs the question, does high-level sympathetic stimulation remain proarrhythmic even in the presence of an effective dose of a beta blocker? And then maybe dual blockade of MPY signaling um, as well as the beta receptor you know, gives an added antiarrhythmic effect. So to start trying to answer some of these questions, we developed a Langendorf heart model together with Manish Kala, who's a EP fellow who's doing a PhD in our group who's here today, where we could induce VF or have a VF induction protocol through burst pacing. The nice thing about this system is the Langendorf's in constant flow mode, so that if there is any vasoconstriction from MPY, at least you're not restricting the oxygen delivery to the myocytes themselves, and I think that's quite important. The nice thing about this VF induction protocol is because you've got a baseline drivetrain here, then any changes you're seeing are independent of heart rate. And then you give your 5 seconds 50 hertz, hertz burst, you repeat an increase in current amplitude, and when you finally get into ventricular fibrillation, you can cardiovert the preparation with high potassium, and the heart recovers. So you've got a system whereby you can repeatedly induce ventricular fibrillation and show a ventricular fibrillation threshold that remains constant. And this has got an advantage over, for example, coronary artery ligation, ischemia, reperfusion, which are very you know, stochastic measures of inducing ventricular fibrillation. 
And what we found is that application of neuropeptide Y at the sort of top of the dose response curve, which we've initially done in atrial preparations, is proarrhythmic. In fact, about halves the ventricular fibrillation threshold. It's pretty much equivalent to something like isoprenaline, which we all, you know, which we're all more familiar with in the EP lab. Moreover, if you use antagonists of the different neuropeptide Y receptors, we find that a Y1 receptor at least can block this proarrhythmic effect, whilst the Y2 receptor is not antiarrhythmic. And this led us to look at isolated ventricular myocytes. This is from a rat model. And as you can see here, there's both staining of the Y1 receptor at the membrane, and also with Western blots, we can illustrate the presence of the Y1 receptor on the ventricular myocytes. So I, I suppose to try and bridge these two levels between the isolated myocyte and the whole heart, what we look to do is culture a quiescent ventricular monolayer. So this is a 35 milli millimeter dish with 700,000 ventricular myocytes that have been cultured. And we're imaging this using a dye-free optical imaging technique, thanks to um, Gil Bubb, who's really sort of um, you know, pioneered this technique. And what we find is when we put on neuropeptide Y at the same concentration as before, is the induction of, uh, you go from a quiescent dish to the induction of ectopic activity. That uh, I don't know how well it's shown up here, but you can see a wave there propagating away from the focus of induction. Another way of looking at this you know, over a longer time scale is to take regions of interest. Here's a very quiescent monolayer over about four seconds, and after application of neuropeptide Y, first the red area has started spontaneously bursting, and then you can see a bit later the blue area as well. So it's certainly seeming to have a proarrhythmic effect on this monolayer. If we build this up to a, a, you know, back up to the Langendorf heart model, then we've tried to develop a uncoupled blebostatin Langendorf preparation with dual calcium voltage imaging on the heart. So we can start looking at what it does to electrical properties of the heart and calcium handling. And this is very preliminary data, again, with the help of Gil Bubb and Manish Kala. We're not finding much effects on conduction velocity, but we're certainly finding steepening, for example, on our at least an initial work here of the restitution curve. And you know, as you bring in your S2, you get a, a progressive shortening of the um, action potential duration here, and the slope of that relationship is getting steeper, which is certainly fit with the proarrhythmic effect. But this is all exogenous neuropeptide Y. What about endogenous release? And to try and answer that question, we've developed a Langendorf model which actually has the stellate ganglia still intact. This is an incredibly challenging dissection. I'm very happy to show you, show you it and uh, explain how it's done. Essentially, it involves cannulation of the aorta whilst the heart is still in situ with ice cold ringer to bias time to then dissect underneath the paraspinal muscles and to, to lift most of the mediastinum out and actually get at the sympathetic chain posteriorly. And in fact, we can dissect out most of the sympathetic chain together with the heart. And we, we're able to get stimulating electrodes right onto the stellate ganglia, either left or right, and stimulate them accordingly. And you know, you can get some nice curves that look something like this, different frequency dependent increases in heart rate and contraction, which are blocked by a beta blocker like metoprolol, which is what we tend to use clinically. And, you know, unsurprisingly as well, you get larger contractile effects with the left stellate ganglia and actually somewhat surprisingly similar tachycardias with each, again, of which a beta blocker like metoprolol prevents. What we did find was interesting, though, was that metoprolol does not affect the drop in ventricular fibrillation threshold when you stimulate the ganglia, which we kind of assumed it would. It's the beta blocker that we use clinically. So this is after a long period of, or, or should I say, a high-frequency sympathetic stimulation. I think if you're, if you're tickling the, 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 the stellate ganglia at low frequency for short periods, then metoprolol works quite nicely. Thank you very much. But if you do two minutes of stellate ganglion stimulation at something like 10 hertz, which is what we found in our isolated atrial preparations, is the sort of frequencies where you start to get co-transmitter release, then the effect of metoprolol it's not so good. 
Is it because metoprolol is just not at the right dose? I mean, that's what I would say as a skeptic. Well, an unpaired T-test on its own, it's certainly not affecting ventricular fibrillation threshold. And if you test it against a high dose of norepinephrine, one micromole at the top of the dose response curve, metoprolol works perfectly fine at preventing the proarrhythmic effects. So I don't think it's because we're underdosing here. What about if we collect the coronary perfusate? and try and measure neuropeptide Y in that perfusate, well, unsurprisingly, the levels are quite low at baseline, but certainly in both right and left stellate stimulation, if you measure the MPY concentration, you're getting large increases when you stimulate either stellate ganglion in this circumstance. So I suppose the, the killer question is, well, what if you block a beta receptor of metoprolol, but you combine that with the Y1 receptor antagonist, what does that do to ventricular fibrillation threshold? And the answer is that combination in these circumstances is very effective. So here's the drop in VFT despite metoprolol. Here's combining metoprolol with BIBO, which is the, um, which is the Y1 receptor antagonist that we're using. And finally, ventricular fibrillation threshold remains stable and intact. So just get to go back to Peter Schwartz's article about cutting nerves to save lives and to the many autonomic modulation therapies that we've heard about today, you know, whether it's stellatectomies, thoracic epidurals, renal denervation. Bear in mind, these are in patients on the maximal tolerated dose of beta blockers that we can possibly get them on. So how come all these you know, neuromodulatory therapies are, you know, could be beneficial? And the answer is, well, maybe it's not just all beta receptors. I put beta 1 here, maybe beta 2 as well. Maybe there is also an action of neuropeptide Y release directly on these myocytes acting on a y on receptor. Never mind a crosstalk to the vagus nerve, for example, via a Y2 receptor. Excellent. Thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to thank particularly David Patterson, who's been my mentor over the last 15 years or so, to the research team and also to our collaborators who have helped with this work. Thank you very much. Thank you.